let us launch the series with the scripture um, that births this desire to be imitators of God. Uh, therefore, be imitators of God. So step one is you have to believe that you can do that, right? I know I do this over and over and over, but this has to be how it's done. If you don't agree with him, you just memorize the verse or you just decree it, but you don't believe it in your heart. This is, that's what brings the substance of faith and hope into the manifestation of what is unseen into the scene. And so that has to be there. You have to believe that you can be an imitator of God. And some of us have been on the planet for 30 years or more. And, and we have all this history that is telling us that there's no way. And we've got to renew our minds and be ye transformed by the word of God who is alive and active and full of power and let his power influence what we've given power, old belief systems, our past, our history, what our parents said about us and tear down so we can rebuild and walk in the newness of life. And that's a process. And as usual, this is just a divine trap for intimacy with Papa. Everything. Because it's like, oh, it's a, some people are like, oh, it's a process and I'm going so slow. No, no, no. God is going, I enjoy every moment, every prayer, every tear, every song, every time you skin your knee and run to me. He's in it to win it for you. Because technically he already won it and he's walking you into your win. So that's exciting for him. He already sees you as a finished product. Well, how can you say that, Daniel? I'll tell you exactly how I can say that. Jesus looked at Peter and goes, on this rock, I'm going to build my church. Was Peter doing real good in his revelation and at the time? No, no, not at all. He was in process, putting his foot in his mouth. And uh, I think it's in less than four scriptures. He's saying, get behind me, Satan, to Peter. I'm going to build my church on you, Peter. You're the one, baby. And then a couple of scriptures later, you are being influenced by Satan. Get behind me. So God sees you as a finished product, but will work in your present moment with his presence and clean you up to get you into his mind and his desires so you can be an imitator of God in the earth. Everybody's like, oh, God's going to come and everybody's going to repent. God's going to come through me and everyone is going to repent. That's not arrogance. That's his plan. We are the continuation of the incarnation. He planted himself in the earth to multiply himself in his church. Christ and you, the hope of glory. People are going to experience his goodness and his glory as you say yes to the divine trap of the process of growing up into sonship so eventually you can manifest the reality of who is in you into the sphere of the earth and then the earth will stop groaning. Amen. A lot of people are like, how come so many people come against me and cuss me out or tell me no when I'm asking to pray for them? Or That's them groaning. They're groaning for you to become the fullness. That's what they're doing. They're like, ah, quit praying for me. They're basically going... I need you to be Jesus because Jesus doesn't have problems casting out demons. Jesus has a good track record with that stuff. And if we'll choose to yield to the divine trap and get to know him and let him possess us, we will get to the place where we are moving in the reality of the spirit without measure. Everybody's like, there's nobody in the Bible that, you know, didn't ask Jesus for help. The guy with the chains didn't directly go, Jesus, I want to be delivered today. And he was breaking chains and killing people that would walk by. And everybody in that territory was terrified of him. But Jesus' belief was bigger than the demonic in that guy's life. Well, I don't really know if I believe this stuff. Well, I believe that all things are possible for those that believe. And I believe that love conquers everything. And if I am fully manifesting love and powered by God... I win, no matter how big the demonic stronghold is and no matter how big the wall is. Well, we need proof of this. Okay, I'll give you proof of this. I got a phone call from a really awesome mom who I used to drug counsel their son when I was a carnal counselor. And I didn't do a very good job at it because I wasn't giving them the word of God. I was band-aiding their addiction. And then years later, I would watch, I've watched 10 of them kill themselves because it doesn't work. Only the word of God works. 
And she called me and she said, my older son just got pistol whipped in a drug deal. And I was like, oh my gosh, bring him to church. She was like, he doesn't believe in any of that stuff. I was like, I don't care. God believes in him and God's in love with him. Now I'm not telling you that 24-7, 365, that I am in the, the gift of faith in Corinthians 12. But at that moment, I was in that. It was on me. I was like, I don't care if he got pistol whipped. I don't care if he doesn't have an ear. You know, bring him. And uh, so, he, so he comes. And the only two things that I know are wrong with him is that he broke his nose and he broke his jaw and he can't open his mouth. So his nose is crooked and has a gash right here. And his jaw is like this. And when he talks, he talks through his teeth. And he's not super happy about being there. But there's a level of brokenness and desperation in his heart. And I think that is the help me that's necessary. Okay? If there's an absolute, if there is a necessity, it doesn't necessarily mean they're like, oh, please heal me. I believe everything right now. But I believe that man is without excuse according to the Bible. And inside of every man, woman, and child is a fundamental belief in the Creator. And there's always somewhere in them something crying, help me. And we're the answer to that cry because it's no longer us who live, but Christ who lives in us. And Christ is the answer. The only answer. The only way. The only truth. The only life. Amen. So he sits down and Pastor Ben Daniels at Pathway starts prophesying over him and it's powerful. And he's prophesying over his mom and his mom starts crying. Was anybody there that, that day? You were there, you were there, you were there. <laughs> this is wild, dude, super wild. And, uh, and she starts crying, and then we, we sing for a really long time, because that's just, amen, what, what, we, what we do. And uh, so we sang for close to an hour. And people that aren't used to worshiping for that long don't really like that. So the mom and the boy walk out. And I look at Pastor Ben, and we just have like a knowing, like a sinking. You know how we accidentally <laughs> preach on the same stuff that builds upon builds upon builds upon builds, and we don't talk to each other about it, me, Doc, and Pastor David? Yeah, because we're, we're, we're in sync together, amen? We're in agreement, one spirit. And me and Pastor Ben, we, we had that. And we both knew we needed to go, we needed to go on the offense to, to assault them with love, if you will. So he starts prophesying heavily over the mom. And then she just starts getting wrecked more and more. Super accurate words. And, uh, and then he looks at me and he's sitting on the stage. So he would be sitting up probably about this high, you know, from the floor. And uh, he goes, Daniel, do you want to say or do anything? I said, yeah, I really do want to do something because God does. God wants to manifest the reality of the finished work of the cross in this guy's life. I want to pray for you. I want to pray for your nose and your jaw and God's going to heal you right now. And, um, and his mom, she's a little uncomfortable. She's like, like, what if this doesn't work? You know, whatever's going on in her head that isn't going on in my head because I'm totally possessed by love at this moment. And I go over to him and I put my hand on his broken jaw and his nose and I speak. And, um, and uh, as I'm praying, Pastor Ben jumps off the stage and goes, go! Because his nose goes bunk and goes right back into place and his jaw opens and he starts weeping. This guy didn't believe in Jesus. This guy didn't want to come to church. He was forced to come that night. But there was a cry in his heart. Yeah. Anybody ever been pistol whipped before? Yep. <laughs> yeah. It brings you a little desperation in you, you know. And uh, so he gets healed and he starts crying. And he gives, that, and you know what's funny? That's not even my favorite part of the testimony. This is. He says, I said, do you want a king like Jesus, the one that just healed you? What a way to experience the gospel. Not with wise and persuasive words, but a demonstration of power and love in the Holy Ghost. And uh, we'll eventually get to the message. No worries, guys. And um, test God really likes you talking about the wonderful works of the Lord. Amen? Amen. Revelation 12, 11. We got some theologians in here. <laughs> so, uh, so he yells. I repent. I give the lordship of Jesus to my life. And just so powerful, you know. And, and then I said, is there anything else on you that's hurting? Because the only two things I knew was the broken nose and the broken jaw. He goes, I have a shattered cheekbone as well. Also can't really imagine that one. I've been hit in the face a couple times. 
Never shattered my cheekbone though. And uh, so I'm like, so this is hurt. He goes, real bad. He goes, my nose is good. It's straight. My, my jaw is fine now. But my, I said, you pray for yourself because you have the resurrection power of, of Holy Spirit in you. So pray for yourself. So he just mimics me. He doesn't have like deep revelation. He just has childlike faith. He's seen it work. He knows it works. He's heard me preach on it that day and that's it. And so he puts his hand on his cheek and he goes, in the name of Jesus, I command my cheekbone to be, it's better before he even finishes it. And his cheekbone gets totally healed. It was absolutely wild. And so his mom, yeah, amen. Go Yeshua. So his mom is absolutely tripping out at this point, jaw to the floor, still crying and really confused. And um, she pulls me into my office and she goes like, what's going on? And I'm like knee deep in explaining to her what's manifesting here and why. And, uh, and he walks into the room and he goes, I was too scared to tell you this, mom. Well, he's holding, I think, Taco Bell. Uh, he said, I had broken all of these teeth when I got pistol whipped and I have all brand new teeth. And he showed them to his mom. <laughs> yeah, that's awesome, dude. Yeah. So in the nice way possible, Dan's not that cool. God did that. God don't have to. Yeah, God paid for that. And we need to get ourselves to a place where all things are possible. All things are possible for those that believe. Say, I'm a believer. All things are possible for me. Amen. Therefore, become imitators of God. Copy him and follow his example. As well-beloved children imitate their father. So, patience. First Corinthians 13, 4. We all know that First John says, God is love. So when you see love, you can plug in Yahweh. You can plug in God. Um, charity, love, suffereth long and is kind. Charity envieth not. Charity vaunteth not itself and is not puffed up. Love is patient and kind. It is not jealous or conceited or proud. Love is patient. In order to know what patience is, it's good to know the definition. Most people, like me, before this, said patience is just, I'm waiting. <laughs> I'm in traffic, I'm being patient. That was about it for me. <laughs> You know, I have other examples I could use that are a little bit more emotional, but that was about it. And that's why we study to show ourselves approved, rightly dividing the word our God so we can show ourselves approved and not be ashamed. You know that that's going to happen to some Christians, right? Amen. The Bible says we do this so we cannot be ashamed, which means there's a time and a place where some Christians are going to be ashamed. That's not being mean. That's just being honest. The word patience is macrothumia in the Greek. Because the Bible wasn't written in English. It means patience, <laughs> forbearance. And so I always have a good, healthy Miriam Webster next to me who is a spirit-filled Christian for the other definitions of stuff that I may know some of, but I wanna know more of. I wanna know the full definition so I can see the full counsel of God defining what he's saying so what he's saying can fully speak and impact me. If I don't know what he's saying and I only know what part of it means, I'm only standing under half of the revelation so I can only function in a partial reality of his commission, his command, his statute, or his word. This is why we need to know definitions. I want to know what they fully mean so they can fully impact me. Amen? Forbearance. No, never use that word in 30 years on planet Earth. So I don't even have part of it. I'm functioning in no forbearance, to my knowledge, because I don't know what it means. Okay. It means refraining from the enforcement of something such as a debt, a right, or an obligation that is due. Forbearance is refraining from the enforcement of what is right, what is owed, or what is due for someone in a circumstance with you. So if I'm in forbearance 
and someone says, I'll pay you on Friday. And Friday comes and they fall on their knees and they go, man, have mercy on me. Have, have, have mercy on me. I, I'm so sorry. I'm really trying. I'm really busy. I'm barely making it. Forbearance would be, you owe me that debt, but it's okay. Next Friday, that's when it can be due. I'm moving your due date through forbearance. Does that make sense? Okay. Now I'm going to say something that some people might agree with, might not. Praise God that honor comes before agreement. Amen. Amen? I believe that my spiritual integrity comes before and over and supersedes my carnal integrity. So if I come stand up here in front of you and say, in 10 minutes, we will listen to a 10 minute Ian Clayton tape. And 10 minutes goes by and God goes, no, I want to release some words of knowledge to heal people right now. But I said that we were going to do that in 10 minutes. So my yes needs to mean yes. I'm here to tell you God's order in that prophetic moment supersedes anything I've ever said. And if we understand obedience, we'll be okay with that. Does that make sense? I'm not saying break your word, <laughs> but I am saying over and over and over, I'm seeing the manifestation of this fruit in my life because I'm yielding to the spirit of God in me. And the fruit of the spirit is patience, forbearance, long suffering. And I find myself, and I used to beat up on myself. I was beating up on myself last week, actually, or very recently within the past couple days, because I was like, I never enforce consequences. I stink. And then I do this study and God goes, a lot of it is actually just my forbearance. A lot of it is just my long suffering with these people. A lot of it is my divine patience that restrains you from natural reason, hot temperedness where you would normally get mad, which we'll go over later, which is also another scripture. Does that make sense? Yeah. Cool. Patience, forbearance. Forbearance means refraining from the enforcement of something such as a debt, a right, an obligation that is due, and long-suffering. I also looked up long-suffering, even though I thought it was pretty self-explanatory. I'm glad I looked it up. It means patiently enduring lasting offense or hardship. Patiently enduring lasting, not one day, not one week of offense or hardship, but lasting. You know you got God in you when you're making it through the long haul with trials and tribulations going around you. That's a lot of people in this room right now, props. You're yielding to God, you're making it, you're enduring, super cool. Now this is, this is, the, this is the one that uh, macrothumia, this is a, the last definition for patience when it says love or God is patient. Divinely directed patience. Now just, just please let this sink in. Divinely directed patience, which is refusing to retaliate with anger because of human reasoning. Wow. Refraining to retaliate with anger that comes from human reasoning. There is a way that seems right to a man, but it's not God's way, and it's not God's wisdom on the matter. I don't care if that's what you're seeing, if it's not what God is saying. I don't care if that's what you're seeing as a natural man, and your natural reasoning is saying, well, I'm judging this right now by what I'm seeing. That's not how God operates. There's more than meets the eye. Every natural manifestation has strings in the spiritual behind it. God wants us to see what is affecting that natural manifestation so we can have an effect on it and change the natural manifestation. If all I do is look at someone and go, man, you're smoking again? What's wrong with you? That's wrong. Natural reasoning? That's true. Smoking is wrong. It's not a good thing to do. It hurts you. But that doesn't bless that person. My natural reasoning has in human reasoning brought the anger of man against that error instead of the wrath of God and the judgment of God that releases life and light to invite them out of that hurt habit or hang up. I hope you guys are catching this. This is, this is the way we need to see. God doesn't see the way we see. God doesn't judge the way we judge. God doesn't think the way we think. 
His ways are higher than our ways. His thoughts are higher than our thoughts. They're greater. They're multifaceted. God doesn't see in one perspective. He sees all the way around, up and down, 360, every angle. Knows every heart. You can think that way. You can get his mind alive in you because ye have the mind of Christ. Oh, refusing to retaliate with anger because of human reasoning. Amen. A huge reason the adversary doesn't want us working with patience is because it perfects us. That terrifies the adversary. Let's say that again. A huge reason the adversary doesn't want us working with patience is because it perfects us and that terrifies the enemy. When we actually become an imitator of God, we will walk down the road and the spirit of repentance will be released and people will get saved, healed, and delivered because we are being overshadowed by the Most High. Because we look like him, which means he can sit on us and overshadow us. Under his wings. Okay, that doesn't mean he turns into a bird and flies over you. No, it means that you are a reflection of him. And he gets your permission to sit on you and possess your full vessel in all of your life. It wasn't because Peter's shadow was special. His black floating shadow was special. No, it was what was overshadowing him that brought the healing where they knew if they brought out the sick and the dead, they'd be healed and raised up by him walking by. Amen. Amen. Testimony. Please put up the picture. So, I'm walking around the mall. Why, yes, I am a bass man. I like that fishing shirt. That's my shirt. I like it. Um, we're walking in the mall and I'm with an intern and we walk by this, these two guys and they're trying to sell stuff because that's what people do at the mall. They try to sell stuff. And sometimes it's annoying. Somebody say amen. amen. <laughs> it's okay to be honest. <laughs> you walk down the mall and you get a football field length down and you've been asked by seven people if you want makeup, if you want your hair did, if you want a massage, if you want this special ab toner magnet thing to sh shake your abs. And sometimes it can get annoying. We're not fighting the devil, we're fighting to stay in the spirit. And when you're not in the spirit, that's annoying. Is that right? So I walk by and I don't, I don't remember exactly what the intern said, but something along the lines of, that's annoying. Period. And right when that was said, I, I made eye contact with one of the salesmen and I just started like, like falling in love with him. Not in a homosexual way, but in a father loves everybody way, the creator loves his creation way. And this person's probably older than me, but that doesn't matter because the ancient of days is possessing me as I yield to him. Amen? Who doesn't have a beginning and have an end? And who's erasing my genealogy so I can grow up into his? Okay, so we walk, we go to some store that my intern wanted to go to and we come back and I start talking to them. And, and this is what I do. I Marco Thumia in manifestation. Because I, I don't go up and go, you need to be healed right now like I used to, to everyone I ever saw. I want to embody God and his characteristics so people can see him and encounter him. And not just a wild, zealous steer without a bit in its mouth that's out of control, full of zeal, that's way ahead of his revelation. So I ask questions. Hey, what is this, man? What's your stand about? And he goes, well, we're actually like a recovery program that's faith-based, man. And it saved my life. And I'm like, man, how long have you been sober, bro? He goes, man, I've been sober for 10 months. I was like, awesome. I just let them go, go, go. Go to the next guy. I'm like, how long have you been sober, man? And they're like, man, this guy cares about us. That's setting a stage for a way easier manifestation for whatever they need. Because I'm setting the, the foundation of love there. So then love can just flow on the foundation of what we've built in this atmosphere of trust and compassion. So after, I don't know, five, 10 minutes of listening to him, I go, well, 
my sobriety date's 12.30.06. And they're like, oh, a veteran, you know? Which is like, in, in the recovery world, first five years, young in sobriety. You're still considered really young. Double digits, you're like, whoa, you know? Because it's like the hardest thing because they're teaching you one day at a time, brother. You can just one day not... God's good. Every day is awesome. You have an expected end, you know, like none of that stuff's being really taught there. And so, so their eyes kind of light up and I'm like, all right, let's get to the nitty gritty. What do you need from God? Oh, I'm good, bro. bro, 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 bro. And I'm like, no, you're not, dude. You got pain in your butt. He goes, yeah, my foot's real jacked up. <laughs> I was like, okay, I'm going to touch your foot and pray for you. Is that okay? And uh, he, yeah, yeah, absolutely. So I pray for his foot. And I'm like, move it around. And he looks really awkward and confused at this moment, which I like because something's happening to him. And I'm like, how's your foot? And he goes, it's better. I said, don't you lie to me. He goes, I wouldn't lie with God. I, I wouldn't lie with God. My foot is better, you know? And I didn't know the intern was taking pictures. Super cool. Look at the backside of me. How cute. And um, it was just awesome, man. But patience, showing him patience. Love listens, you know? And we want to have the characteristics of God. That's why we're doing a series on being an imitator of God. Not so we can legalistically be like, well, I have to try to be like this. That's not my motive here. My motive is to tell you that you have everything you need for life and godliness. My motive is to fill them on one six, get you to believe of, about every good thing that is already in you in Christ so that your faith may become effectual. I want you to become effectual everywhere that you go with the love of God out of overflow relationship and intimacy with him because you're just yielding and he just gets to be loving and patient and kind and healing to anybody that he chooses to order your steps and have you encounter. Amen? Amen. Way easier that way than like trying to be patient, you know? I tried that, man. When I was in recovery and I didn't know about the word of God at all, I'd be in traffic and I'd be like, ah, I'm patient, ah, you know? And, and now I get in traffic and the spirit of God goes, man, what if they were in an emergency? Would you like to have that thought about them, Dan? I'm like, no, I, I, I don't like having that thought about them, especially if they were in an emergency, you know? And I'm working on my thought life. Did a really cool teaching on holding your thoughts captive. If you want it, it's on Facebook. Amen. And YouTube. Okay. Um, James 1.4. The adversary doesn't want us to let patience do its work in us because it will perfect us. But let patience. This is a really big word right here, you guys. It's synonymous and brother and sister, I would say, with yield. But let patience have her perfect work that ye may be perfect and entire, wanting nothing. It's promised land right there. And I'm here to tell you, patience is a door that leads into the promised land. You need to let patience perform that perfect work in you so the door of his patience can come into you and start working on your soul and so that it can possess your body and then you cannot let your natural reasoning possess you into anger because of what you're seeing because you're seeing from him in you and you're totally okay with waiting forever. I don't care if I have to listen to someone word vomit on me for an hour if I get to tell them about Christ. Doesn't matter, man. I get caught up all the time. I had to make an action item for myself that I can't have phone calls that are super, super long because I'll just stay on the phone for hours and let people word vomit on me. And now I'm practicing, hey, can you get to the heart of the matter, you know? So there are some things that God's having me do in wisdom. But I'm just letting you know that, man, if, if you got to wait and love on somebody for a while, totally worth it, man. They could get totally saved, totally healed, totally delivered. And that's worth it. Let patience have its perfect work that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. So, what do we need here? We need to believe that we can be perfect and lack nothing. Which probably is something that some of us need to repent for if we haven't heard me pound this into you over and over and over. You can be perfect as your heavenly father is perfect because your heavenly father is in you. Amen? Amen. All right, Ephesians 4.2. <clears throat> With all lowliness and meekness, with long suffering and forbearing one another in love. With all lowliness and meekness, with long suffering, patience, forbearing with one another 
in love. Praise the Lord. So forbearing, we read the definition of it. Refraining from the enforcement of something such as debt, a right that you think you have, or an obligation that's due. We're supposed to be in this operation and function with each other in love. So someone comes up to me and they're like, hey, I need 10 bucks. And it doesn't happen. They're like, two days later, I'll pay you back. No big deal. My job isn't to be like, you suck. You didn't do it. You're a banana. And belittle them and condemn them. It's not my job. My job is to represent forbearance in love with one another. We need to get to this place where we're above what someone owes us. You know, you know what I would submit to you? I was going through a really rough season of my life uh, about a year and a half ago. Um, some pretty heavy stuff happened that significantly impacted my family and my well-being and my finances. And the Lord said, my son chose to release every one of their debt through releasing salvation unto all men and give them an opportunity to come into agreement with what he paid for, which is everything. All their debts, all their wrongs, all their sins. You're supposed to imitate and represent him. So I'm here to tell you, I don't care how much you think somebody owes you. I don't care how wrong you think you were wronged by somebody. If you want to be like Christ, you've got to let it go. You've got to release them from those debts. It's a big deal. Does it mean that if they come to you and make amends and pay it off, you say no? No, not at all. That blesses them to do what they said. But you being held captive in your mind by carnal reasoning and mere appearances and not practicing forbearance is actually stealing from your heart and changing the amount of love you can give to that person. Tell, tell me that you love someone the exact same after they've lied to you and cheated to you and broke their word to you 30 times in a row. Tell me you don't treat them differently. I used to until I had a revelation that I'm supposed to be like Jesus. I don't care if somebody puts me in debt for over 40 grand, which somebody did. Okay? And you know what God said? Be like Jesus. Release them from that. Because that's what I do. I'm telling you, I had total peace. I had total peace about it. It was awesome. So this is a big deal. We need to practice this stuff. I'm not telling you stuff that I'm not doing. Amen? Amen. Okay. <clears throat> if most of us would say, if most of us would say, Yahweh, I am forbearing in love with my brothers and sisters in Christ. Am I? Am I forbearing in love with my brothers and sisters in Christ? I don't really know if we would really like the answer. Because some of us are holding accounts of wrong to people. Some of you hold accounts of wrong to me. You're like, man, I can't, I remember when Dan said that one thing that one time a year ago. I'm here to tell you, you're the one being stolen from. Yep. I'm not hurt by that. I got plenty of stuff that could hurt me that's way bigger than your little judgment and your little savings bank in your head. For real. It's only hurting you. Unforgiveness is a chain that binds the unforgiver. Not the one that's not being forgiven. It's not helping that person, but it's really hurting the unforgiver. Amen. That's a good thing to ask though. Not to go feel like you're condemned, but to go, hey, Yahweh, I want to know this stuff. I want the hidden things in me to be revealed by your light. I want you to show me if I'm practicing this word because I don't want to be deceived by not doing your word. You feel me? Okay, I feel the, it's a little weighty in here. Hope everybody's okay. You guys okay? Okay. Proverbs 15, 18. Hot tempers cause arguments, but patience brings, ushers in peace. A wrathful man stirreth up strife, but he that is slow to anger, patient, appeaseth strife, silence strife. You want to beat a spirit? Come in the opposite spirit. When people try to cuss me out when I'm evangelizing, I'm like, hey man, like, I just love you. I just love you. And they're like, Grr! you know? It's cool, man. It's super cool. Hot tempers cause arguments, but patience brings peace. That word patience is 
macrothumia, which we went over earlier. I wanted to know what hot temper was because I'm a pretty passionate guy. And I was like, I wonder if I qualify for this. <laughs> and I want to know because I also know other scripture that says, be angry and do not sin. Which means I can be angry, but not sinning. It's called righteous indignation. I hate what God hates. Amen? So, I mean, just like pride, it's not bad to be like, man, I'm proud of my son. You know what I mean? It's bad to have boastful demonic pride, though. You feel me? Okay. Hot-tempered is chima. C-H-E-M-A-H. Chima. It means wrath, rage, and poison. Hot temper is poison to the one that's hot-tempered. Man, this is what Yahweh told me while I was typing this. Because when I go to type these things and do these things, uh, I'm engaging. And uh, because I want to learn from where he is, instead of like standing in the sphere of the earth going, I hope I'm hearing you correctly. When I go to where he is, I'm just seeing what he's doing and hearing him real clearly. And this is what he told me. This is a little bit long, so I'll probably read it twice. But I really want you to hear this. Woo! Pride, let me, let, me, let me water this. All right. I haven't gargled in a long time. That was a real, my daddy taught me how to gargle when I was younger. He's like, are you go like this? I'd fail. It would go down my throat. <laughs> you know, it's super funny, dude. Okay. Yahweh told me this while I was typing this. Pride is the poison that births hotheads with hot tempers that must, that must quickly defend why they are right by human reasoning because truth is advancing into their deception. So pride tries to be dominant and loud and quick to defend and not patient to cover up its false face of facts that doesn't line up with truth. I'm telling you, dude. I was like, when he told me that, I was like, say that again. Like, like, and so I was slowly typing it. Like, you know, I'm telling you, it was awesome. So I'll, I'll read it again. Pride is the poison that births hotheads, in parentheses, with hot tempers, according to the scripture. Pride is the poison that births hotheads that must quickly defend why they are right by human reasoning, which is in our definition, because truth is advancing into their deception. So pride tries to be dominant and loud and quick to defend and not patient to cover up its false face of facts that doesn't line up with truth. Can you see a picture of this? Someone goes, hey, this is what the, man, I think I have a testimony of this in here. I do, it's right after it. So there's, there's a lot of times where I'll be sitting with somebody. He gave me a cool testimony. There was a picture, manifestation of this prophetic word. So I'll be sitting with someone. And uh, this happened within the past 365 days. I was sitting with someone over coffee. Technically it was tea. And uh, <laughs> thanks, Holy Ghost. And um, he cares about everything, bro. Every bit of integrity God cares about. It's called the spirit of excellence. Well, it's just saying coffee instead of tea, not to me. Amen? And uh, so I'm sitting over tea, and, um, and someone says something, and I simply go, hey, do you believe this that the Bible says? And they're Christian, you know? Most of my friends are Christian. And they're like, yeah, of course I believe that. And then I say, well, because out of the mouth the heart speaks, then this. And, and they instantly go like this. Rah! Don't attack me with the word of God. This is what I saw. This is not what I meant. That's out of context. And they just dominate with their human reasoning because I, with the word of God, am penetrating into their deception that exposes what's really going on inside of them and what's really inside them that's possessing them, which is putting them in bondage, is trying to rear up and fight back because their facts are being presented with truth and they're feeling exposed, so they're panicking. So they try to get loud. Does that make sense? And that's a manifestation of this word. And I, man, I'm telling you, probably almost everybody in this room, if you presented somebody with the word of God that's carnal or influenced by something demonic because we don't battle against flesh and blood, they're actually just a victim that needs to be set free by Jesus, amen? amen. 
That's going to happen because they don't want it. I'll be talking with somebody and presenting them just basic truth and they go, man, I don't want to hear that. I feel like you're manipulating me. I am, through my natural reasoning, saying that you're manipulating me because your truth is getting into areas where I'm actually deceived. This is rough, dude, but it's real. This is, a, this is unfortunately a regular thing where I'm going, hey, this is what the word says, and it's penetrating into areas, and people don't like that, man. So they get hot-tempered, which I've experienced in the past year for sure. So... It's confirmed here in Ecclesiastes 7, 8. Pastor David spoke the first part of this in his last sermon. Better is the end of a thing than the beginning thereof. And the patient in spirit is better than the proud in spirit. Amen. Thank you, Bible, for a second witness. So this is another thing that the Lord told me. I have to turn the page because I hand wrote this and I write like a third grader. Lord, I shouldn't curse myself. I write better. I'm going to write better. Amen. So when I was engaging with God, this is, uh, this, is what, this is what God said to me. I'll just share my engagement with you because I don't really need to act like I'm super, super Christian. So God was taking me into places where I have pride in my subconscious. Not in my conscious life, in my subconscious life. And, and my unconscious life. And this, is, and this is what he said to me. This is so wild. We are, I said, what's going on here? Because literally we were going into my subconscious and I was seeing these trees of pride in some of my current relationships subconsciously and he was cutting them down with me. And, and I was chopping these things down in my subconscious. I was crying and shaking. This was only about two hours ago in my office. He said, God bless you, Pastor. He said, we are not just multidimensional beings. We are multi conscience Pride trees in my subconscious were destroyed today. And it was awesome, man. It was awesome. Here I am standing in front of you, six years into this deal. Been a pastor for four. Pride hiding in my subconscious. I'm hunting it down, baby. Me and Yahweh, dude, I'm hunting it down. Thoughts that I'm better than certain people sometimes. Not conscious, subconscious. Belief trees that steal from me. But if I'm not willing to go to these other realms or these other consciences in me, I'll never find these. You have to let God into these places. This is not automatic. He's not a demon. He doesn't force himself upon you. You've got to yield to his love and go, I'm willing to find out if I've got hidden pride. Amen. And guess who did? And guess who got to cry and shake with his daddy as I tear him down and get more freedom? Me. It was awesome, man. But you got to be willing to go there. Amen? We are not, multi, we are, we are not just multidimensional beings. We are multi-conscious beings. We have other realities of consciousness where things can try to hide. Anybody ever heard of this? Yeah, yeah, uh... They told me that I was raped when I was five, but I don't remember any of it. That kind of stuff. I don't remember any of it. But they have the proof, the guy got arrested, whatever. But it's not there. It's hidden in your unconscious. Defense mechanisms and walls in your psyche block that from ever getting conscious in your life. Because it wants to hide and keep you bound. And then you're just like, well, that's just the way I am. I don't like people hugging me. You feel me? That's bondage. People not being able to hug you, that's you not being free. You, you get it? Amen. Amen. I thought that was real neat. Amen. Romans 12, 12. No more trees. <laughs> really good. Cut down the old trees, plant the new trees with the word of God. Rejoicing in hope, patient in tribulation, continuing instant in prayer. This was... This was a real fun adventure for me. Listen to this translation. Let your hope keep you joyful. Be patient in your troubles and pray at all times. So while I was, while I was typing this out, God said, <clears throat> God told me, read this scripture as if it has no end and no beginning. I want you to read it backwards through me. And I was like, okay, no problem. So I said, 
pray at all times, be patient in your troubles, and let your hope keep you joyful. And then boom, I heard the rhema voice of the Lord. He said, son, if you pray at all times, patience has your permission to penetrate your troubles with real hope that will bear fruit of joy in and all situations. I'm telling you, dude. You can be taught by Yahweh, dude. And it is probably the most exciting thing in the world because really he just shows you the operation of things to get them functioning and flowing into your life from his word. I'm going to read it again. So he said, read it backwards. Pray at all times. Be patient in your trouble. Let your hope keep you joyful. And he said, son, if you pray at all times, patience has your permission to penetrate your troubles with real hope that will bear the fruit of joy in any and all situations. So, we all know being prayed up is good. But did we know scripturally being prayed up at all times is the key to having the manifest patience prepared already for any hard trouble that comes that will let hope flow into the fruit of joy that brings healing from the core of our being because joy and laughter is medicine to the heart, question mark. I mean, that's pretty cool. I I type, wow. I said, you see what God did there? He taught me by his word to go into the life of his word to get the life and truth and reality alive in me and functioning a way that it works to work the works that work, which would Dr. Tim released a couple sermons on about a month ago or so, maybe a little more. Attorneys invading time. It's all getting squished together for me. Psalm 41, not Psalm 41, Psalm 41. I waited patiently for the Lord, and he inclined unto me and heard my cry. Yes. 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 That's pretty intense right there, man. I waited patiently for the Lord's help. Then he listened to me and heard my cry, is another translation. It's a big deal. There's a theology going around that God hears you no matter what and all the time, and that's not biblical. There's actually a scripture that says, if I'm bad to my wife... God doesn't hear my prayers. Wow. Yeah. Wow. I know we don't like talking about some of this stuff. We're like, he's so good. I, dude, he is better than I even know. I am still finding out facets of his goodness. But his word is law. Yeah. When it says that something is an action that has a reaction, I don't get to negotiate it. Even if it stinks. But here's the, here's the deal. In Romans 13 it says, all authorities are given by God and ordained by God. You've got nothing to be afraid of if you're living in the law. I'm not talking about the Mosaic law. I'm talking about just living for the Lord, doing what he says. I have nothing to be afraid of, of God not hearing me when I'm treating my wife well. Do you feel me? And that's exciting because then I just find out what he says, which are his blessings and spoken favor over me. And I do what he says and I stay blessed. Amen? Super easy. And guess what that is? Relationship, walking it out with your father. And then I I correlated it to, and I didn't give it to him. Uh, I waited patiently for the Lord's help, and he listened to me, and he heard my my cry. We're correlating everything with patience, which which is macrothumia, Exodus 14, 14. If you only be still, if you only be still and patient, the Lord will fight for you. (laughs) Come on. You see why patient? That's why the enemy don't want you being no patient. You feel me? He doesn't want you practicing patience. It'll perfect you and it will put you in position for almighty God to fight your battles for you. He's like, they cannot understand patience or practice it because then I lose everything. They find out that they are unlimited in God unto perfection and God will fight their battles for them. I just lose. I mean, that's really intense. Last scripture, Lamentations. I like jumping around the whole Bible because all scripture is inspired by God. Amen? Given by the inspiration of God, I should say. Because that's what it says. And those mean two different things. All scripture is given by the inspiration of God. Which when I first got here, Pastor David Hope released a ballin' word on. It was so good. Uh, The Lord is good to everyone who trusts him. The Lord is good unto them that wait for him. To the soul that seeketh him. 
It is good that a man should both hope and quietly wait for the salvation of the Lord. The Lord is good to everyone who trusts in him. So it is best for us to wait in patience, to wait for him to save us. And it is best to learn this patience in our youth. Super cool, man. This is macrothumia, 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 forbearance, long suffering, patience that is divinely instructed by the Lord and is not possessed by anger that is powered by natural reason. Those are all in the definitions here. We need to be aware of this stuff. I, I, I used to have the interns pray this prayer over and over. Jesus, help me with my situational awareness. So a prayer that has to do with this would be, help me be aware when I'm reasoning something by the natural and not by your divine inspiration and appraisal that comes from your spirit and agrees with your word. Because I'm telling you, we're getting stolen from. We retaliate to things that never should be retaliated to. We react and, we react and fight back to things that God doesn't want us to react or fight back to. And I'm preaching to me, man. I've had some things come against me in the past year. Some of them I handled real well. Some of them I didn't handle super well. And I'm learning to practice this stuff. Amen? Practice, practice, practice. And if you practice, you will be perfect. If you practice and let patience work in you, it will breed perfection in you. That's what the Word of God says. You receive this? Yeah. It's a big deal, you guys. So we're going to walk through imitators of God. That's what we're going to do on Wednesday nights. Be ye imitators of God. You can imitate God 100% on this planet. If you don't believe that, it's in 1 John as well. As he is in this world, so are we. As Jesus Christ is in this world, so are we. How is Jesus right now, guys? In a glorified body, sitting in victory over the devil. That's you. Amen? And we're growing up into that reality so we can walk it out. Practice, practice, practice. Cool? Go ahead and put your hands on yourself. Say, Yahweh. Yahweh. I yield, I yield. To, patience. to patience. And I let her, and I let her work, work in, me in me and through me and unto perfection. Help me practice, Help me practice. Yielding, to you, yielding to you so I can forbear, so I can forbear. With, one with one another in love, in love. According, to your word. according to your word. I've got this I got because you've got this, you got this. In, Jesus name. in Jesus' name. Amen.